everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be here together. And I hope that you're going to enjoy this worship service this morning. We're going to start off with one song called All My Ways. So I'd like to stand and, stand and sing as we open up this service with this song. Church, what a beautiful September long weekend, eh? Loving it. We're uh, glad you joined us for worship this morning and uh, trust that this service that's been prepared will uh, nourish you, strengthen you in your faith. My name is James Drieger. I'm the lead pastor here at the Blue Nord Community Church and I just want to 
take some time here at the start of our service to let you know about some of the different opportunities and needs here in our church family. But before we do that, how about we pause? How about we take some time here at the start of our service to position our hearts to receive from God in prayer? And so I invite you to pray with me. God, I'm reminded of your word this morning from Psalms 46, which reads, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God, while the world around us is often so loud, it pushes you far from our minds. While it's so often busy and chaotic and increases our fear and anxieties, you invite us here in your word to come before you in silence, to still our hearts, to know that you are still in control. You are with us. You are our fortress in this world. You are still God. Bring this truth to bear on our hearts and minds this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a few announcements then. And uh, we're in September already, and that means we've got a lot of kind of new programs and, and new rhythms and schedules starting up in the church as we enter a new ministry year. And so just to list a few of these things this morning, if you're interested in getting bapti baptized, uh, we're hoping to start up those baptism classes again in the coming weeks. And so if baptism is something you're interested in or you want to chat with someone about a little bit more, uh, please be in contact with Anthony, or Pastor Anthony. He'd love to hear from you and get you involved in those, uh, those classes leading into baptism this fall. Then uh, another cool opportunity that we still have is, is the opportunity to be a part of religious exercises in our local public school. And so um, uh, Pastor Mitchell and Val Barkman are looking for some volunteers to help out with five-minute uh, morning devotionals. And uh, if that's something you feel like you could do, a way you could contribute to our community and pour into the kids of our community, uh, reach out to Mitch or, uh, or Val. They'd love to hear from you. Uh, worship committee, we're also uh, kind of new bands are starting up, I think, next week for the, for the rest of the year. And so one of the bands is hoping to add an acoustic guitar player yet. And so if you can play acoustic guitar, we'd love to join you to that rotation. And I think how that rotation goes is you're on for two weeks and then you get a month off and then you're, you're on for two weeks and then you have a month off. And so if that's something you could commit to, uh, uh, reach out to he us here at the office. And we'd love to get you plugged in there. Then, then a reminder that Sunday school is starting up on the 17th, so that's two weeks from today, and uh, that's for all ages, and, um, and uh, actually all of our volunteer needs for Sunday school have been filled, and so a big thank you for everyone who's, who stepped up to help us there with our volunteer needs. Um, and on a similar note, uh, next Sunday there's going to be a breakfast meeting for everyone involved with kids ministry this year, so Sunday school, kids church. Uh, Come join us here at the church in the basement at 9 a.m. Uh, we're going to have a breakfast meeting before we kick off the year. Then just to mention a, a couple upcoming events. Uh, there's our monthly church prayer meeting this coming Wednesday night here in the sanctuary at 7. So come and join us. Um, there's a seniors lunch coming up mid-September. There's a senior high youth retreat at Eagle Lake Bible Camp being planned for the 22nd to 24th. Um, there's some men's events coming up, including a service day where if you can help them out, they'd love that. And if you have uh, needs, things around your yard that you would, you would like some help with, let them know. They want to bless you and serve you. And then there's also a men's retreat coming up at the end of the month, and uh, you'll be able to register for that. And so for, for all those things uh, and more details, uh, check out the bulletin. Uh, there's some more information there for you. Then one more thing, uh, I guess it's September long weekend and everyone's excited to get the, the last bit of summer in. And so there's no kids church this morning because all of our six volunteers couldn't make it. And so uh, I guess that's what you get when your summers are really short in Canada. So on that no note, if, uh, if you need to use the nursery or baby room, it's up there. And uh, there's a stair access from the foyer back over there. Let's leave announcements there for today. I invite you to stand, greet a neighbor as we uh, worship together.
pages to work through here. Okay. Revelation 5, 6 to 10 says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. to bring 
for many, many years, and I always have these ears in my ears where all I can hear is us and them. Well, just now I turned them off so that I could hear you, and it was loud. It was beautiful to hear this massive choir singing, is he worthy, is he worthy, he is, and I think that must be a beautiful sound to the Lord, a beautiful fragrance to him, and so thank you. Thank you for singing so heartily. I'm going to teach you a new song now. It's called The Jesus Way, and it speaks of um, how we want to follow the Jesus way. And what is the Jesus way? It, the, some of the words go like this. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. If you hate me, then I will love you. If you're helpless, I will defend you. If you're burdened, I'll share the weight. If you're hopeless, then I will show you. If you strike me, I will embrace you. If you chain me, I'll sing your praise. If you kill me, my home is heaven, for I choose the Jesus way. So think about those words as you sing this morning. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. If you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. If you're burdened, 
Morning. I'm going to be reading from Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over, while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. 
So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. It's uh, not every Sunday that we have someone preaching our church for the very first time, but uh, today's that the case. Uh, the preaching team has invited uh, Bryce and Hebert to uh, share God's word with us this morning. For those of you who don't know Bryson, uh, he grew up in this church. He regularly attends with his family, and he's served in our church community in several areas, including at camp this past summer. And uh, he's just finished uh, two years at Miller College of the Bible, and if you've gotten to know him at all, uh, you know that he's a real passion to tell people about the good news of Jesus. And uh, he's really good at dressing up. Uh, <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt with flamingos on it, and he's got a, a suit and tie. Wow, that's awesome. That's great. I love it that you take this so seriously. We're excited to give Bryson this opportunity, and uh, we look forward to hearing what God has laid on your heart. Bryson. Praise the Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today, I'm going to be preaching on Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46, which Mr. Reimer already read. Um, let's start with a time of prayer, and then, and then we can get into this passage. Lord, I pray um, just for this sermon. Lord, I am I'm so grateful that, that you've placed the gospel in my life. And, and Lord, I just pray that as I share it today, um, your glory would go forth, that the gospel would just take a deeper root in our lives. Lord, and my words are weak. I am not a man of, of eloquent speech, Lord. And I just pray, I pray that your glory would go forth um, despite that. Lord, and if I, yeah, if Lord, if I'm humbled through this sermon, then I pray that glory would be to you. And I just, Lord, I pray that the gospel would just go forth in this. Um, yeah, in your name, amen. Okay. This place, or this, this passage places Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, which its name means oil press. And this is where a place, this is a place where olives would be crushed and turned into olive oil. Um, the garden is also of massive significance in this passage due to the failure of Adam in the first garden, sinning once and providing um, and cursing all of humanity. But Jesus, as the second Adam in the garden, um, he obeys the Father's will and he actually provides salvation for all of humanity. And so it's just to show the success of Christ. Um, right before Jesus enters the garden, there's a detail that John's gospel adds that none of the others, other gospels do. Um, and it says that, that Jesus crossed the ravine of the Kidron, um, which had a brook in it. And this, this brook, it would flow red with the blood of lambs that had been slain at the temple during Passover week. Um, and some reports even say that the rocks in the stream were stained red because of the amount of blood that flowed through it during this time. And this is the exact time that Jesus was crossing this brook. And so as he's crossing it, there is blood flowing through there. And this is a reminder to what he's about to do on the cross. Um, as Jesus steps across it, he says, and he goes into the depths of the garden, he prays this in verse 39. My father... If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What is the context of this cup? What is the cup that Jesus is referring to? In that prayer, he asks for the cup to be remo removed. This cup that our Lord mentions in the garden is much more than just the physical agony that he endured on the cross um, and the sufferings by the hand of the Romans and the Jews. Um, but it's actually a reference to the biblical motif or literary pattern um, of the cup of the wrath of God. And we see this in Isaiah 51, verse 17, where it says, Wake yourself, wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. You have drunken from the, Lord, the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl of the cup of staggering. It's Jeremiah 25, 17. 25, 15 to 17. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, 
Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I'm sending, sending among them. Um, Ezekiel 23, 29 through 34. And they shall deal with you in hatred and take away all the fruit of your labor and leave you naked and bare. And the nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered. Your lewdness and your whoring have brought this upon you because you've played the whore with the nations and defiled yourself with, with their idols. You've gone the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. Um, Revelation 14, verse 10 through 11. He also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the, cup of, into, the, into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And these are just a few of the passages that talk about the Lord's anger and his wrath in this cup. And I think before we get much deeper into the sermon, it would be best to clear the air of some misconceptions about the wrath of God. Um, there are way too many Christians that believe that God's wrath is like a child throwing a temper tantrum, um, and destroying everything it can to prove a point. I, believing, I believe it is fitting to first biblically define what God's wrath is, rather than bring our own definition to the table. Firstly, it is absolutely critical to understand that God's wrath and his love are not in conflict. But God's wrath is because of his love. Desiring God has a very good article about the five truths of the wrath of God, and the writer does a good job of defining it. He says this, God is love, and God is all things for his glory. 1 John 4, verse 8, and Romans eleven thirty six 36 say this. He loves his glory above all, and that's a good thing. Therefore, God rules the world in such a way that brings himself maximum glory. This means that God must act justly and judge sin. Example, responding with wrath. Otherwise, God would not be God. God's lo- love for his glory motivates his wrath against sin. If we were to try to cover up the wrath of God... There are many passages that need to be swept under the rug. We run into many issues with that. Um, many of the issues that we have with the wrath of God as, uh, as humans is due to lack of understanding of who we are and who God is. We need to understand that God's wrath is actually one of his perfect attributes. And that's a good thing that he is wrathful. A king who does not get angry and, and conquer those who opposes him is a weak king and cannot protect those in his kingdom. Um, In the same way, a father whose child is killed gets angry and desires for the person to feel the the punishment that they rightly deserve. We also need to understand that God is completely holy, which basically means that he is separate. Paul Washer explains this in one of his sermons, that that God's holiness is like like a knife. You cut cut something in the kitchen with a knife, but you're not just cutting it, you're separating it. God is so high above us. He is the majestic Lord who sits in the heavens, who and laughs as the nations rage. He is a God who even the devil needs to answer to when he wants to do devilish things. We see this in the opening chapter of Job. God is separate from sin, and he cannot dwell with sin, nor can he allow sin into his presence. I think Leviticus and Numbers probably have the worst reputation for being quote-unquote boring books. Um, But in my first year of of Bible college, I had the opportunity to, to study them, and what I came away with was much different than the attitude I had gone into it with. I realized that, that, that God is, um, he desires nothing but perfection. All these rules and laws were not because God is an OCD nitpicker, but it's because he's holy. holy. And that's not something to be trifled with. Scripture over and over again says to fear the Lord. God is incredibly terrifying. If we were to stand in the presence of God with no covering, we would melt We could not stand there. The wrath of God is just. Romans 1.18 says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Then the scriptures also talk about God's wrath being being stored up. This is talked about in Romans 2 verse 5, where it says that the wrath of God is being stored up against the sinner for it to be revealed against them on the day of the Lord's wrath. The same verse says that this is to be revealed as God's righteous judgment. God is wrathful, and that is a righteous attribute the scriptures say. To summarize what I've said here, um, we need to make sure that we let God define who he is. He has done this by revealing himself in his word. 
He is God's wrath is not a bomb that randomly explodes, spo- explodes, but it's rather God's love and holiness reacting to sin. God is a holy God who deserves nothing but perfection. When we feel as though God is being too harsh with judging people in the Old Testament, it's actually us that's in the wrong. We need to look at these situations through God's lens. So when Jesus is talking about the cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is talking about the wrath of God that is poured out against sinners. Can you please turn with me to Romans 3, verse 23? I'm sure many of you will know this verse already. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is possibly the worst news that any of us can hear. We often read this verse and we shrug it off. Like, yeah, uh, I've screwed up a couple times. I've done maybe a couple bad things. I swore once or twice. I accidentally got drunk. But it's no big deal. If God was really angry with me, I wouldn't have all this nice stuff. I wouldn't have this nice house and my money and my good health. And this, this thought has gotten through my head far too often. And it's wicked. It's wicked to think that a God who deserves nothing but perfection, who holds your next breath in his hands, while tens of thousands of angels sit around his throne, crying out, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. It's unthinkable to think that he can dwell with that. He can't. We are not a good people. We are born sinful. The psalmist writes in Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Our condition as humans just gets worse and worse the more we look at what Scripture says about it. We often look at the nation of of Israel in the Old Testament, and we seem to think that our condition is much better than theirs. They continue to sin and fall into idolatry, and sins that are incredibly grievous against God, who has been nothing but good to them. We often take God's patience as his approval. Romans 2 verse 4 says this, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Your blessings in life are not God's approval of your life. They are kindness meant to lead you to repentance. We cannot take God's blessings as approval. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 says this, In due time their foot shall slip. There is no reason in us for God to uphold us in our sinfulness. The sinfulness of our sin will cause us to slip when God has appointed it. We are all undeserving of anything good, God in his incredible kindness has not only given us blessings while we are here, but in his incredible patience, he has given us time waiting for our repentance. We often assume that our sin is not that great, and we can assume that our hands are fairly clean. Like Pilate, we wash our hands and we say that the blood is not on ours. But it is us that brought Christ to the cross. And like Uzzah in the Old Testament, when the oxen stumbles and the Ark of the Covenant starts to fall, he reaches out for it, and the moment he touches it, the Lord strikes him dead. R.C. Sproul says in his book, The Holiness of God, Uzzah assumed that his hand was less polluted than the earth. How often do we do this? How often do we believe that our hands are less polluted than the mud on the ground? The Lord holds in contempt every action that does not please him, that does not glorify him. From the unborn man, I often hear the quote, love God, love others, getting thrown around a lot. Um, and so many people are like, oh, that's really simple. This is, this is good news. That's easy. It's not. Mark 12, verse 30 says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and all our mind. And this keeps getting worse because I've never done that. There's never been a moment where I've loved God with all of that. I haven't. I, 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 that, this is terrible. This is so bad. Um, And if I decided to do good things, it was for myself. It was to get a good feeling. It was for selfish desires. Every single second that I lived before becoming a Christian was held in contempt against God. And every second I lived was storing up more and more wrath for myself on the day of that Lord's wrath. When you kill someone, you get a life sentence. But when you commit petty theft, you maybe get jail time and a fine. You understand the severity of the crime, or you understand this, yeah, you understand the severity of the crime by the punishment. It's like this with hell. 
And so when God has entire nations wiped out because of their sin, it's not too hefty of a punishment because it shows the severity of their sin against a perfect and holy and righteous God. Many times in my life, I have questioned the love of God because of hell. But what helped me come to terms with a good God being able to throw people into hell eternally for the punishment of their sins was to understand that I can't say God is unjust for doing that, but rather understand that God judges by his son. And because Jesus is the, the fulfillment of the law and prophets, he is, he is perfect, and he is the, he's the mark that we should meet. And how is, who's ever met that? None of us. He is the mark of perfection that we need to reach, and when we don't, we fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is the standard by whom we are judged. If you are not in Christ, then God shall make you drink the cup of wrath which is rightly due to you. Romans 3 verse 10 states that no one is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. We have fallen and we have rejoiced in our sin. The first time we sin, we deserve to have been cast down like the angels. The angels sinned, sinned once and God cast them down, never for a chance for them to for never a chance for them to repent. God should have done that with us. He would have been just to do that with us. The moment we first sinned, he should have let us slip into our punishment. God could have thrown every single one of us into hell and still be loving because God gets to define what love is. God is complete in himself and there is love and unity within the Trinity. He doesn't need someone to love but himself. James 2 verse 10 states that if you've kept the entire law but fallen short on one point, you are numbered with the transgressors. You are guilty of all of them. Your, our sin makes us deserving of an eternal punishment. One sin, and we've spit in the face of God. I wish we could understand the sin, our sin to its fullest extent. I, could, I wish we could understand the adultery that we've committed with idols. We are so sinful and dirty there is nothing we can do to get us out of our sin. We are so entrenched in it like pigs to a wallow. We lie and we bathe in it like a dog to its vomit. We go back to the sin that kills us. We have desired it more than God. God requires us to follow his law, and every time we disobey him, we are those who spit on Jesus as he makes his way to the cross. I'm the one who spit on him. I'm the one who mocked him. I'm the one who denied him three times. I'm the one who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. I'm not good. We're not good. I realize that this sermon so far has been quite bleak, and I was hoping it would be this way. I want us to realize the pit that we have dug ourselves into. No way out of our own doing. When Jesus is walking through the garden, the entire time, he's being tempted not to go to the cross. The last thing the devil wants for Jesus to do is die on that cross because he knows the moment that he does, the forgiveness of sins has come. So as Jesus is walking out to the place where he shall pray to the Father and ask for the cup to be removed, he is in agony. Verse 38 of the 26th chapter in Matthew says that even to death, our Lord's soul was anguished. The physical death is not what Jesus sweat blood over. He was sweat blood because of the spiritual pain that he was about to endure. I found this quote by the Puritan Thomas Brooks, incredibly impactful for understanding the sufferings of Christ in the garden. For the first, that Christ suffered in his soul, I shall thus demonstrate. First, express scriptures do this evidence. Isaiah 53 verse 10. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. John 12, verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came into this hour. Matthew 26, 37 and 38. He began to be sorrowful and very heavy. These were but the beginnings of sorrow. He began. Sorrow is a thing that drinks up our spirits. He was heavy as feeling, a heavy load upon him. Verse 38. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Christ was as full of sorrow as his heart could hold. Every word is emphatical. My soul, his sorrow pierced his heaven-born soul. As the soul was the first agent in transgression, so it is here the first patient in affliction. 
the sufferings of his body, the sufferings of his body were but the body of his sufferings. The soul of his sufferings were the sufferings of his soul, which was now beset with sorrows and as heavy as heart could hold. Christ was sorrowful. His soul was sorrowful. His soul was exceeding sorrowful. His soul was exceeding sorrowful unto death. Christ's soul was in such extremity of sorrow that it made him cry out, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass. And with strong, strong cries and tears, Hebrews 5, verse 7, to cry and to cry with a loud voice argues great extremity of sufferings. Mark 14, verse 33, Mark saith, and he began to be amazed and to be very heavy, or we may more fully express it thus, according to the original. I can't read Greek, so I'll skip that part. <laughs> he began to be gastered with wonderful astonishment and to be saturated, filled, with, filled brimful with heaviness, a very sad condition. All the sins of the elect, like a huge army meeting upon Christ, made a dreadful onset of his soul. Luke 12, 43 to 44, it is said, He was in agony. That is a conflict in which a poor creature wrestles with deadly pangs with all his might, mustering up all his faculties and forced to grapple with them and withstand them. Thus did Christ struggle with the indignation that this cup may pass away. If it is possible, let this cup pass away. Luke 12, 42, 43. While yet an angel strengthened his outward man from utter sinking in the conflict. Now if this weight that Christ did bear had been laid on the shoulders of all the angels in heaven, it would have sunk them down to the lowest hell. It would have cracked the axle tree of heaven and earth. It made his blood startle out of his body in congealed clotter heaps. The heat of God's fiery indignation made his blood boil up till it ran over. Divine wrath affrighted it out of its wanted channel. The creation of the world cost him but a word. He spake and the world was made, but the redemption of souls cost him bloody sweats and soul distraction. What conflicts, what struggling with the wrath of God, the powers of darkness, what weights, what burdens, what wrath did he undergo when his soul was heavy unto death? Jesus in the garden was under extreme agony because of the wrath that was being laid upon him. Jesus was carrying the full weight of the sins of believers on his shoulders by himself. As the Father lays the wrath of God on Jesus, he says, not my will, but your will be done. Please turn with me to Isaiah 53, and we will be reading the entire chapter. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers, shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death. And although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When, he, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressor. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. When Jesus was in the garden, 
and his disciples were sleeping while he was facing the most intense pain that any human has ever felt, he is about to enter the presence of God to become the sacrifice for our sin. He is about to have his blood poured out as an offering for our sin. His death and agony is what we deserved. We know that Jesus is both fully man and fully God. A human could never have paid for their sins in three days. Never mind the sins of the entire world. So why does the wrath of God never cease in hell against the sinners, um, yet Jesus can take the sins of all who believe in his death? Because he's God. The torment that Jesus encountered in the garden was so much more than we could ever bear. If we, were to under, if we were to feel a fraction of the torment that Jesus faced in the garden, we would drop dead. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that right after Jesus became sin for our sake, it says here, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a flip that happens when Jesus takes your sin, when he dies for you. He takes your sin... And you become his righteousness. He is our righteousness. Jesus is that reason. The only way we can approach God's throne with confidence is by being covered in the righteousness of God. When Jesus was dying, he was covered in our sins. He was bearing the punishment that we deserved. We all have felt guilt and shame seasons where we only see our evil. We feel as though we are garbage. There isn't a positive thought in our head about ourselves. We've all had seasons like this. I'm going to say something that might be a bit edgy, but Jesus did not come to save us from low self-esteem or guilt. He did not come to save us from bad thoughts about ourselves because those thoughts are actually true. The devil, when he's accusing us of these things, we fall in, and when we fall into the bat pit of bad self-image, that's actually truth. But in a much more real sense, it's not. He came to be our righteousness. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This verse says a lot of things. It was the Father's entire, entire salvation plan. It was his plan to crush his son so that you could become the righteousness of Christ. The Father loves us not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And Jesus gave himself up as a willing sacrifice to become our sin so that we could become his righteousness. Jesus' Jesus's death doesn't erase your slate of sins. He throws it on the ground, and like Moses with the Ten Commandments, he breaks it. There's no more slate for you to start again. He's, you've become a new person. A person whose life is in Christ, so that when we approach the throne of God, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus, the perfect, blameless, pure, holy Jesus. This is why it's called the gospel. It's the good news. Those bad thoughts about yourself are not what Christ saved you from, but those bad thoughts deny the gospel. Because that's to say that Jesus isn't your righteousness. You are fully redeemed. Paul says in Romans 8, verse 33 to 34, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. God is the only one who has any power to condemn, the only one who has power to throw both body and soul into hell. And what has he done instead? He has become our righteousness. The Father's plan from before time began to show his mighty right hand in saving sinners who were too far gone. You were saved from the wrath of God by the love of God for the glory of God. The entire salvation plan is about God. When you are redeemed in love by God, 
from the righteous and just wrath of God. It was all for the glory of God who will keep you in his loving hand until the day of completion mentioned in Philippians 1 verse 6. How beautiful is this news? How sweet is our salvation? The psalmist also talks about the cup of blessing in Psalm 116 verse 13 where it says, I will lift the cup of my salvation and call on the name of the Lord. The cup we deserved was the cup of wrath. It was filled with the wine of the Lord's wrath. But that wine, that, that, that cup, the Lord drank for us. So that cup has been turned into a cup of blessing, from wrath to blessing. That's why during communion, we drink wine or grape juice. It's to remind ourselves of the cup that Jesus drank for us. We remind ourselves of the high cost that Jesus paid on the cross that took the cup of the wrath of God and made us a chosen holy people set apart for the Lord. Jesus did not die and just stay dead. Instead, he was raised back to life. And then what does he do now? Romans 8, 34 says this, that Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He continues to sit at the right hand of the Father and be a living reminder of who we are in him. That we are no longer alive but dead to the flesh, and we are no longer dead but alive to God. I'm going to bring you back to the start of my sermon, where I talked about the blood that flowed through the Kidron Brook. And it stained the rocks red with blood. And that's what we are as Christians. We have been stained perfect by the blood of Christ, who was slain for us. The blood of the Lamb that flowed over us has made us pure, no longer the natural color of sin, but the sin, but the color of the king, the holy king who died for us. Our identity is in Christ. We are no longer our own. We are Jesus's. Everything in our life is because of the goodness of God. He has poured out so much grace on his children, and when we reach heaven's gates, it will only be by the grace of God, which has saved you and has kept you until that day. The Gospel of John says that as Jesus died and as he hung on the cross, and with a loud cry of anguish, he said, It is finished. He gave up his spirit. It is finished. He has taken the worst of sinners and he has dealt with their sin. He has taken my sin, which I clung on to for 16 years of my life, my rebellion, my pride, every single sin that I have ever done, and every single sin that I will do. He took the wrath that I deserved. It should have been me on that cross. It should have been me with the full wrath of God being poured out against me. That should have been me. It should have been me in the pits of hell as I paid for my heinous crimes. It should have been me. But God, but God in his loving kindness, I am no longer held in condemnation. But I am fully justified because of the Father's sovereign plan and hand to orchestrate salvation and because of Jesus' work and his continued intercession and because of the Spirit's sanctifying power and prayers that cannot be expressed in words. We were condemned, we were damned to eternal punishment, we were haters, prideful, unjust. We were the wicked nation. We fell short of God's righteousness. But God has made us to be a new people, a person that is covered in the righteousness and purity of Christ. So we are the one of whom God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. If we cannot apply the scriptures to our lives, then it is all for naught. So I have a couple points of application here. The first point of application, and this is fairly simple, but I believe that the greatest thing the true Christian can do is just resting in the knowledge of your standing with God. That neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He has taken the wrath. 
There's no more slate for our sins to be written down on. He has taken the wrath that we deserved. Rest in that. This should also cause us to live differently than our old sinful selves lived. When we sin as Christians, it's a grievous thing. It is something to be mourned for. God calls us to be holy as he is holy. But every time we sin, we cheat on God, and we basically tell God that sin was more pleasurable than him. But we must not get stuck in the rut of self-deprecation, because that denies the gospel just as much as sinning in the first place. My mentor at Miller this last year was an incredibly godly man, and something that he said to me many times after I had fallen into sin was that um, there is just as much grace and repentance as never having sinned in the first place. When we fall and we repent and mourn over our sin, we are not called to keep sitting in that, but to get back up and keep fighting, knowing that in the eyes of God, nothing has changed. You were justified before your sin, and you were justified after your sin. You did a grievous thing, but Jesus took that. He took it on himself. You are still blameless and perfect in the eyes of God because of Jesus. I will leave my sermon off with this. Will you drink the cup of wrath that has your name? Or will you drink the cup of blessing and grace and mercy and compassion that has Jesus' name on it? Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for getting me through this. Thank you for going with me. Lord, I couldn't have done it without you. And I just pray that your words would have gone forth. Lord, please don't let people see me. Lord, let me be a nobody. May it all be for your glory. Please, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to introduce the closing song. I found a song this week that I was listening to while on the tractor. And um, just... It really, it really connected with what I'm preaching about and, and it was something that I was able to meditate on and, and just reflect on what Christ has done. Um, so yeah, it's called Jesus Thank You. <laughs>